In this video, I'll go over how I animated this flat character in Maya, the way I set up the layout, and discuss how well the rig held up during animation. In the previous videos, I showed my process for rigging this character, and this is the animation test to see how well the rig is working. This is what it looks like from a perspective view. I set up a multiplane with different levels for the background, midground, and foreground elements. Separating the elements on different levels like this gives us room to overlap the character in the environment, and it creates a sense of depth when we move the camera. Everything in the environment is made from simple polygons with flat shaders. The cart looks like it has more dimension to it, but it was made with flattened polygons with different materials to help define the top, front, and the sides of it. And the pieces of the cart were separated in depth so there was enough space for the character's arms and the props to fit through it. For the camera, I set the focal length to 90, which flattens all the elements a bit more than a standard 50mm lens. If we look at an extreme comparison, the window on the left has a camera with a focal length of 27, and the window on the right has a focal length of 1000, so the wide-angle camera on the left gives us much more perspective and depth than the extra long lens on the right, which keeps the characters much flatter. Again, I only used a focal length of 90 for this animation test, but I have used much longer lenses for these type of characters. For the animation, instead of moving the character in Z, I animated him along the x-axis and scaled the size of his body and limbs to make him look like he gets closer to camera throughout the shot. This scale probably isn't that noticeable during the animation, but it's easier to see the size difference when I switch between the first and the last pose. When the character changes direction, I decided not to flip the body by scaling it in the x-axis. Since his body is a simple shape, it was easier to flip and reposition the eyes, the mouth, and the limbs to pose the character in the other direction rather than to flip the body. The mouth was animated using three rig replacement shapes. It starts with a closed mouth shape and a shape for the corner of the mouth, then swaps to the open mouth rig, and I flip the mouth control by scaling the X channel as he turns. When the character trips, I swap to the circular mouth shape and turned off the shape for the corner of the mouth. And then I swap back to the open mouth shape at the end of the shot. This is what the mouth looks like if I separate it from the rest of the rig. On its own, we can see when the mouth shapes are swapped, and it's pretty jarring when the mouth flips to the other side. But when we switch between replacement shapes during a quick body move, like on the turn, then it works really well. The hands have two sets of fingers and thumb rigs. So to interact with the props, I swapped between the straight finger rigs and the curl finger rigs, so the finger and the thumb geometry wraps around the geometry of the props. To lock the props to the hands, I used parent constraints. There are locators under each of the character's hands, and I constrained the props to both of those. Then by animating the constraint weights, I was able to switch the hand the props were following. The arms and legs were set up with joint chains and IK handles just like I would for a standard 3D rig. With a standard arm rig, I would move the IK in depth and use the twist channel or pull vector constraint to get a foreshortened pose. But if I do this with a flat rig, then the geometry tips towards the camera and the flat look of it falls apart. So instead, I scale the length of the arm joints to get the poses with foreshortening. I pose these type of rigs as though I'm drawing the character. So instead of using perspective to give depth, I scale the controls to get the poses that I want. For the shadow, I rigged a simple polygon with controls that could be used to animate its shape. And I used a point constraint so that it would follow the body control. A point constraint drives the translation channels of an object. But you can limit the constraint to just one channel. So I set it up to only follow the X translation of the body, which makes it look like it's sliding along the ground plane. And then I used the additional controls to reshape and animate it. As I was rigging this character, I animated quick tests to make sure that I liked the way the controls were set up, and that I was able to pose him the way that I wanted. It's common to animate calisthenics tests to make sure the pivots are in the right place, verify rotation orders, and see if the skin binding is working. But I like to use these early tests as a way to also develop the personality of the character and define the animation style of the film. Overall, I was happy with the rig, but based on the animation test, there were a couple of changes that I wanted to make. The first was with the eyes. The eyelids are flexible and can be shaped well enough, but when I close the lids completely, there was no way to define the edge of the lid since they're flat shapes. So I added another shape to the eyes that could be turned on and posed to create a line for the closed eyelids. I made the controls for this lid line shape a child of the existing upper lid controls so it would automatically follow the upper lid shape and could be adjusted with its own controls. The other change that I made was with the controls in the palm of the hand. I initially rigged the hand controls in a simple hierarchy, which works well with translations and rotations, but not as much when scaling. Since the arms and the hands are a dark flat color, I treat them as silhouettes and wanted to be able to scale the palm of the hand to change its shape. But in a standard hierarchy, when you scale the top node with non-uniform values, it stretches the space of whatever's below it, so I lose control over the shape of the fingers. To solve this, I separated the fingers from the hierarchy of the palm controls. I know this might seem like more work to have to manually reposition the fingers to match them up with the hand geometry, but this avoids that scaling issue, and it really isn't that much more work. If we want to get a little trickier, we could use constraints to connect the fingers to the palm of the hand controls. 
This way the fingers will follow the translation and rotation, but since it's not under the hierarchy, then it doesn't have the scaling issues. I'll show how I set up this behavior using the thumb control. First I'll parent the thumb control under the main hand control instead of the palm control. Then I'll add a group node over the thumb control and constrain that group node back to the palm control. And now the thumb follows the palm control's translation and rotation. It's not affected by the scale values and I have full control over the shape of the thumb. And since it's a child of the main hand control, I can scale the main hand and everything still scales together. My goal for these first rigging videos was to keep them as simple as possible while still being helpful. But I find parts of this rig to be too limiting. Like for the hand, I would add more controls around the outside of the palm so I could get much more control over its shape. But I'll cover more of these controls with the next character. Lastly, I used Lambert materials for all the geometry and I rendered it with Arnold. But I have also used surface shaders for these characters to get a completely flat color. With the surface shader, you won't get any gradients or shadows. The two green squares on the left have the same surface shader, but you can't see the inner square when they overlap because there aren't any gradients. Whereas both the green squares on the right have the same Lambert material, which picks up light and shadows, so you can see the inner green square when they overlap because of the gradients. And the differences between these shaders are even more obvious when you render it. Both of these shaders give a different look. The surface shader allows you to make a seamless shape with multiple polygons, whereas a Lambert shows separate shapes with gradients and shadows. This character was designed with simple shapes just to go over some of the main rigging concepts with these flat puppets. And I'll go over more rigging concepts with this character who has line work, clothing, teeth and a tongue, and hair. So I hope you find some of these techniques useful and stay tuned for more 2D and 3D videos.